Hello? Do I have to turn anything on? Do I have to turn it on? <laughs> Sounds like it's working. Okay. All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Thank you. All. I'm counting because I want to know, are there more of you in the audience than us on the panel? And I think we just made it. Um, so I'm Tamar Jacoby. I'm president of Opportunity America. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, you know, we, I think a lot of us know that um, the people that care about apprenticeship, and I'm looking at Bob, and I'm also looking at others in the room, that they're really devoted to apprenticeship. <laughs> and this morning you proved it. <laughs> so thank you very much for being here. And for those people who are watching at home, in the comfort of their home, um, we know you're devoted to apprenticeship too. So thanks for being here. Um, I'm just going to talk for a minute about what we're going to talk about today, just frame the conversation, uh, and then we'll get going. Um, so we're here to talk about industry-recognized apprenticeship. Um, Opportunity America is releasing a new report today. I think you all have it. Um, and the idea behind the report is really to bring two strands or two developments together. Um, the first development is kind of a long-term American trend, um, industry-led, led, excuse me, unregistered apprenticeships um, have a long tradition in America. And a lot of us have long suspected there's a lot of them out there, but we haven't known how many, we haven't known whether they were any good, we haven't known how they maintained quality and wanted to know more about quantity and quality. Uh, and, uh, but there was very little research for a long time. So that's kind of one thing, you know, big landscape out there. But the second trend is a newer development, and of course that's the Trump administration. You know, along two years ago, along came uh, President Trump and the administration, and um, they announced an initiative around industry-led apprenticeship. But they were drawing on this long, or they weren't necessarily drawing, or they were, you know, are they drawing on this long tradition? So what Bob and I decided we would do is we would try to bring those two strands together that we would look a little harder at, what, at that landscape out there and try to figure out what is out there. Um, we would try to draw some lessons from that landscape for policy. We would also try to draw on countries with robust apprenticeship programs uh, that, uh, you know, traditions, Germany, now England, other countries that have robust traditions, take, learn some lessons from policy there and bring those things together. The, the, what we know about the programs in, in, in the, the programs in the, under the radar in America, the unregistered programs, what we know about how apprenticeship works in other countries, and draw some lessons for policy. Um, so that's what's in the paper, and that's what we're here to talk about. We'll dig deeper into all those things. Uh, before I give up the mic, I just want to thank a few people. Uh, number one, I want to thank Bob. It was a real honor and a real pleasure to work with you. Um, you know, I learned more than I can say, and I also have fun. Um, so, you know, we, and we are wrestled a little, but um, thank you, thank you for, for your contribution to this. Um, I want to thank our funder, who's sitting somewhere in the, in the, over there, hiding in the back row, um, Annie Casey, uh, Annie, K Annie E. Casey Foundation, and Allison Gerber in particular. And Allison has been supporting my interest in unregistered apprenticeship, you know, before it was even, like, safe or respectable. And so I really appreciate that and appreciate your support for this project. Um, I want to thank the employers I spoke to, the places I visited, and the employers I spoke to for the four case studies in the paper. Um, uh, th and some of you are here today. Thanks for making the trip. And even if you're not here, you're, uh, you're in the footnotes, so um, you can't get away. <laughs> uh, and then, um, last but far from least, I want to thank my team at Opportunity America, who I don't see, but they made this possible. There, Zeria. Zeria, uh, Zeria Cummings in particular. Uh, we wouldn't, this event wouldn't be happening um, without my team, and most of what I do wouldn't be happening without my team. So, so thanks to my team. So with that, um, I'm going to give the mic to the moderator of our first session, um, Eric Sells now. I mean, always, I'm never going to pronounce that quite right. Um, former Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, in the Department of Labor, uh, Employment and Training Division, and now a Senior Advisor at Jobs for the Future. Great. Thank you very much, Tamar, and thanks for doing this event. Um, so, uh, the, uh, apprenticeship in this kind first of all, thanks for doing the report. Um, I actually did read it before I came here today, um, even though it's released today. Um, and it was, a, it was a great report to have. I think um, there's a lot of conversation in this country for the last five years about apprenticeship. Apprenticeship uh, for the last 100 years, 200 years in this country has been sort of um, 
ignored and not attended to other than building trades, manufacturing, and a few other um, industries. And in the last five years, there's been a major transformation in the apprenticeship system in this country. Um, more recently, uh, and again, that transformation started probably when Bob started writing about it years and years ago, but really in the last five years with the Obama administration's investment, energy, and enthusiasm towards apprenticeship and that continued interest through the Trump administration um, and their focus on it. So I think we're in the really early stages of a transformation of work-based learning and apprenticeship in this country. Um, we've been down this road a couple of times before. There seems to be some staying power and there's a lot of interest. Congress has invested about $800 million in apprenticeship in the last five years, while Congress has and federal agencies have. So those investments are rather significant, in my view, historic on what is happening um, in this field. Um, what is most important, I think, is that you have to believe, and I think most of us here do, and most of the people watching that, high quality, applied learning, experiential learning works. Um, gets people in the workplace, working with other people, teamwork, skills, all of that. So from the notion that applied learning works is a really critical part of this. If I dropped in from another planet, I'd be a little bit confused. There's registered, unregistered, work-based learning, apprenticeship. So, you know, as we get in the weeds a little bit on this, it, it, it can be pretty daunting to people and daunting to employers out there about what apprenticeship and work-based learning actually is. Different definitions, different understandings. I think what this paper does is bring some order to that conversation, and I'm very much appreciative of that. And, and <clears throat> there's a lot of tension in the world these days about um, registered, unregistered, industry-recognized apprenticeships. All apprenticeships should be industry-driven and industry-recognized. Uh, but there is a lot of uh, lack of understanding about those, so I think the paper really helps in saying there's a lot of very good workforce and job training programs out there. Um, there's some very good apprenticeship programs out there, whether they're registered or unregistered, and having a better understanding of that is very helpful. So with that, um, I just want to thank you for doing that report. The conversation and the discussion, I think, is going to be helpful for a lot of people. I would say this last issue, um, especially uh, Bob, uh, and many of us who've been in this field for a long time, whenever in the history of workforce development has apprenticeship been this front and center in a conversation? It hasn't been, except for about the last five years. So major investments, they're talking about it on Capitol Hill, they're talking about it in federal agencies, it's an initiative of the White House, so of course apprenticeship is becoming um, much more popular and interesting and a topic for conversation. A lot of circles, not just here in Washington, D.C., it's happening all across the country. So with uh, actually all across the world, because the movement and the global apprenticeship uh, activities are, are well, that, that'll be another webinar that we'll do and another paper that they'll do. But um, anyway, thanks for participating here in the snow in D.C. and for joining in at your desk or at home. And I think with that, I'm going to turn it over <clears throat> back to our authors of this report to give a summary of the report. So, um, but just to set the stage a little bit, for those of you who don't know Tamar Jacoby, she's president of Opportunity America, um, uh, uh, a, work, a D.C. based nonprofit working to promote economic mobility, work skills, career, uh, and entrepreneurship for poor and working Americans, a former, former journalist and writer, did a great job in this report. And then Bob Lerman, who I think I'm going to go to next. Uh, Bob's an institute fellow at the Urban Institute, professor emeritus of economics at American University, and a research fellow all over the world, but at the Institute of Labor Economics in Bonn. And, and both of you have been writing and looking at this issue for many years, so it's very helpful that this report is gone. So Bob, I'm going to turn it over to you, I think, to talk about the report, and then we'll come back and have a discussion about it. <clears throat> Thanks, Eric, and thanks to Mar, thanks, Allison, for uh, including me on this project, uh, and thank you all for coming. Um, I first want to say something about my theory of social policy, <laughs> which is incrementalism toward a vision. Um, there's a lot about incrementalism that we need to take one step at a time. But it's important that we have a long-run vision toward it. So you can't jump from where we are to some long-term vision in one step. You need a number of incremental steps, but those steps should all be guided toward what is your long-run long vision, whether it's in welfare policy. Uh, we have Jason Turner who orchestrated his vision there, uh, or in um, workforce policy. Um, so what is my vision? Uh, well, my vision is that apprenticeship become uh, a mainstream 
route to rewarding careers by a large segment of our population. Uh, by a large segment, I mean at least somewhere in the neighbor of, neighborhood of one-third of a cohort uh, with more and more people having the opportunities to choose uh, this combination of work-based learning, uh, production, and uh, classroom activity, conceptual learning, towards some sort of uh, occupational credential. Um, One-third of a cohort, each cohort in the U.S. is about 4 million. Uh, One-third is about 1.3 million if they're in program for three years. Uh, that's about 4 million at any one point in time, which is similar to President Trump's moonshot idea of 4 to 5 million apprenticeships to actually mark Benioff of Salesforce recommended it, and uh, the president agreed. Now, you might say, well, four million, is that even feasible? Um, it is. Uh, if, if we had the same share as the average of Australia, Canada, and the UK, we would have four million apprentices in the United States. So these are developed countries. They're not Central European countries that have this super long tradition, um, but yet they were able to scale apprenticeship. The other part of my social policy vision is mainstream programs, but with a hidden agenda. So these are programs that apply more broadly to all types of people. Um, in, uh, in the UK, more than half the people that want to become engineers want to do it through apprenticeship. So they're at the high level, they're at the medium level, they're at the mixed level, to upgrade every occupational area. Uh, but I think it would have a particularly beneficial impact on people who uh, learn best by doing. Uh, whereas right now we emphasize what I call the academic only approach, which is you stay in school as long as you can, and then when you get out, you start looking for something. So uh, apprenticeship meets both, both elements. Now, um, while Eric is correct that uh, we've had a bigger uh, discussion of apprenticeship uh, in the last five years than we did before, we did have an earlier bout uh, of interest uh, President Clinton, George H.W. Bush were two presidents that uh, pushed for apprenticeship, um, and uh, it didn't work. And I think we ought to learn our lessons from that experience, and we ought to learn our lessons, as Tamar mentioned, from the experience of places and countries where it has worked. Um, so what about today and where where are we with regard to uh, this in a sense bifurcation of opinions about uh, industry recognized apprenticeships and what are called registered apprenticeships so for those uh, in the audience that are not that familiar with all the terms uh, registration is a process that takes place either at the state level in state apprenticeship agencies or at the federal level in uh, half the states that don't have uh, the delegated state agencies whereby a program uh, puts forth its proposal for uh, how they're going to skill the workers, uh, what kind of activities and competencies uh, the, the people will learn and it's either approved or not approved. Um, now, one of the misconceptions about registered apprenticeship is that it's not industry driven. Uh, it is industry led in the sense that uh, when somebody proposes something, uh, the people in the various agencies are not experts at every field and they check with a lot of other companies. Is this what we would require? Um, and it's also the case that 
other countries that have more structured systems by which they design occupational frameworks and standards, all, all, all emphasize the role of companies, industries, and so on in helping to develop those frameworks. Uh, we at Urban Institute, we have Diana Elliott here who's in charge of our project on co building competency-based occupational frameworks for apprenticeship, and I can assure you that every one of those is industry driven. Every one of those, any industry or company that wants to weigh in, uh, can weigh in and does weigh in. So where are we now? Well, part of the problem is we have a dearth of research on a whole range of issues. Um, we know there are high returns to apprentices, especially completers. We know that some companies uh, reap a good return. Um, we know that the system is central to commercial and industrial construction, to the skill development there. Um, and um, that the overwhelming share of companies that are, are involved with registered apprenticeship uh, are satisfied and say they, they, like, they like it. But what we don't know, we don't know a lot. We don't know how many companies have what we might legitimately call a serious apprenticeship that is not registered. We don't know why too few companies do register or do create apprenticeships, re unregistered or not. We have not had a survey of company training where you, you survey the companies directly a national survey since 1995. So we, we really don't know exactly how much training there is out there. Uh, what we found, though, uh, from a one survey uh, called the Adult Training and Education Survey that uh, the Department of Education staged was that it looks as if the number of unregistered apprentices apprenticeships, people that have gone through apprenticeships, is, is about the same as the number of registered. So um, it's not necessarily that we only have about 450, 500,000 civilian apprentices. Maybe we have a, a million. Um, now, in moving from this, um, where we are today, toward this longer term vision, it seems to me we need all the help we can get. Uh, we need the help of people who are running good training programs, whether they uh, have been going through the normal registration process. Um, and the Department of Labor, under uh, the Trump administration, is arguing for something called industry-recognized apprenticeship, not fully defined yet. Uh, but something supposedly a bit different from, quote, registered apprenticeship. Uh, by the way, a colleague told me that the word registered apprenticeship wasn't in use until the 80s. Before that, it was all called apprenticeship. In any event, what, what does uh, DOL uh, recommend? Well, they recommend um, the use of certifiers uh, to do a whole range of functions. Um, these certifiers would work with companies and industries to create skill standards. They would certify individual companies that are uh, doing apprenticeships. Um, they would check the quality, including the classroom activity. Um, there isn't anything about them assessing individual apprentices but that's another function that could be uh, put into place. Um, so is that a good idea? Well, we discussed that in the paper in some depth. Uh, and in my view, uh, there are too many functions assigned to this role of, quote, certifier. We don't really see any actual ones going on. Um, and um, there are 
they can be conflicting roles. Um, that is to say, um, if, if you want to certify a company, well, does it really fit the framework of the whole industry? Is it an industry framework? Is it a company framework? What is it exactly? Um, and then there's just, um, I think, a misconception that was evident in the task force report and to some extent um, in, in the way uh, certain guidance has come out about the use of the word industry versus occupation. Uh, apprenticeships are fundamentally about occupational uh, competence and mastery. Um, and occupations can span several industries. So when we say industry, recognize which industry? Is one industry going to be the designer of a particular occupation when that occupation may be used in several industries? Um, and finally, uh, and perhaps most important, it's unclear what will cause the industries to participate, what will cause employers, private employers and nonprofit and public employers, what will cause them to participate when they haven't uh, participated at scale so far. Uh, I don't see a real plan for that. Uh, it seems to me that, uh, at least in the plans laid out so far, um, there are things that companies have to meet to be called industry recognized apprenticeships, just as there are in registered, uh, but there are no benefits. <laughs> at least with registered, although there are only a smattering of benefits, uh, for GIs, and for some state tax credits, and a few other things. Uh, in this case, I don't see any. So what do we recommend um, moving forward? Um, and you can read it in a, like, because of Tamar's brilliant, crisp writing, you can read it in, in like a couple of pages. And what we recommend uh, are about five things. Uh, one is to kind of establish a brand. Uh, let's call it American Apprenticeships. Um, now that brand doesn't come into play from nothing. It has to be, uh, people have to start adopting these apprenticeships and then it becomes a brand. But there can be some branding uh, going on in that space. Second, and here's where we have some difference of opinion, um, I think we need a system to establish uh, occupational skill standards with companies, industry-led, but uh, overseen. I think the Institute for Apprenticeship in the UK is a model that has been used. They just came out with some uh, new fashion design apprenticeship that the whole fashion industry participated in developing. Um, so again, it's not some far out body in Washington that's determining what each company is going to do. It's, it's built in, but it adds a certain level of, of assured quality and also a level of portability. With that, then I think you have the confidence that government support uh, can play a role, uh, mainly in my opinion. Uh, financing the off-job training, and I think we have right now a huge amount of funding for uh, what I call the academic approach to career-focused learning, uh, and I would like to see apprenticeship be uh, put on an even basis with those uh, funding schemes. If we added that, uh, that would also reduce the costs for companies to offer apprenticeships because they would know that the off-job part of it is going to be covered, um, and that uh, could be a, a very important element. Also gives them an incentive to do it through uh, some sort of real skill standard. Uh, the fourth thing, which uh, I really wasn't aware of much back when I was writing about this in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, is the issue of selling and organizing apprenticeships with companies. We need a scheme by which uh, organizations, whether they be private training firms, community colleges, nonprofits, 
whoever has the expertise, the salesmanship, and the organizational capabilities to persuade companies who are filled with all kind of other issues that they're worried about. You know, where are they going to get the next sale? How, why is this supplier screwing up? You know, all kinds of things that they have to worry about day to day. Where should we invest? Um, they have all these things to think about. Make it simple for them to say, here's an area, skilled workers, you're gonna, it's going to be a competitive advantage to have those high-skilled workers. Here's a way of doing it. It can fit within your own scheme. It's not super expensive. The apprentices are going to contribute while they're uh, learning, and uh, you'll, you'll be better off. To be able to persuade them to do that is not an impossible task, but it does require special expertise that no one in the current system, except very few people in the current system, know how to do. And then finally, um, and here I would uh, defer to, to Marv uh, on outcomes and looking at what's the impact. Um, in, um, in England today, they're uh, focusing on um, the whole idea of endpoint assessments of each apprentice to make sure that they uh, know what they're supposed to know to complete. Uh, there's also the issue of are they earning what we expect them to earn? Um, so those, if we were to adopt those five uh, dimensions, I think we'd go a long way uh, toward moving toward an, a vision. Thank you. OK. So I'm going to talk for just a few minutes more, and then we're going to get to uh, a panel, because we want to hear what some people think about this. Um, so I'm going to talk just a little bit more about what's in the paper, and in particular, what's in the case studies. Um, so we did three things to come up with this paper. You know, Where do we find out what we know? Um, I was going to say we mine data, but we didn't really mine data. Bob mined data. And he already um, told you a little bit about what he found. I mean, we, there isn't much data, but there is this ATES uh, um, adult training and education survey. And um, you know, Bob found this amazing number that I do think is worth repeating, that um, the same number of American workers may have participated in unregistered programs as registered. And it's complicated how we figured that out, but it has to do with there are two questions, and one says, do you have a government apprenticeship number? And the other says, did you get to be, a, could you go through apprenticeship and get to a journeyman or something sort of like that? And you can kind of triangulate in between and figure out the numbers. So that's startling finding, actually. You know, I mean, it's a little, it's a little tenuous, but it's pretty, pretty startling finding. Um, the second thing we did is we had a half-day convening of employers and employer associations that actually that either run programs or create the skills standards, who are sort of the certifiers that Trump is talking about, though they didn't call themselves certifiers yet when we had the convening. Um, and we spent a half a day with them, learning from them about what they do and, and why they do it and how their programs work. And it was a, quite an intensive session. Uh, and you know, the idea was to get a, at least a bit of a sample. You know, 20, we learned about basically about 20 programs from that round table. And several people in the room were there. It was a, a, a great morning. And then we, um, the last thing we did uh, was we did four case studies. And, well, okay. <laughs> I went out and I spent time uh, at four programs and interviewed the pe managers who run them and uh, trainers who train and, in some cases, the trainees. And, um, you know, learned a lot about how, the, how, this, how this widget really works uh, when it works well. And we looked at four good programs, right? We picked, you know, we, we waited. We put a thumb on the scale. We looked at good programs. So the programs we looked at, um, the first was the Federation for Advanced Manufacturing manufacturing education, otherwise known to many of us as FAME, uh, started at Toyota about a decade ago, now has 300 companies bought in in 11 states and has been adopted by at least one state as their kind of official approach. Um, Volunteer-led, the key is volunteer-led regional employer collectives drive the bus. They decide what they want. They take over a community college. They, it's, a, it's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful program. And they train industrial maintenance workers. Um, so we'll learn more, a little more about it later, but you can also read about it in the report. 
Uh, number two, Chinro is an industrial construction contractor with operations nationwide. And it has about a dozen different kinds of earn and learn programs. They have registered programs, unregistered programs, entry level programs, sophisticated programs, but about half of them are unregistered. So they kind of know both experiences and they were in a really interesting position to compare both experiences. Uh, their unregistered programs train welders, riggers, pipe fitters, entry level workers. I mean, and this is industrial construction, right? So these people really have to know what they're doing. They're, they're in oil refineries and stuff like that. Um, Number three, um, and we have, have, have them in the room, Fairview Health Services is the second largest employer, um, uh, private sector, excuse me, employer in Minnesota. Twelve hospitals, more than 100 clinics all over the state. A lot of different kinds of training programs, teenagers, disadvantaged youth, incumbent employees, registered and unregistered programs, a couple unregistered programs. And I had a lot of fun um, learning about the unregistered program for operating room nurses. I've never been in an operating room with my eyes open and my, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, my, my standing up. And so that was a really interesting experience. Um, and Laura Beath is here from Fairview. She's going to tell you more about it. And the last one was um, Mercedes Benz of Arlington, um, just to a, just a hop across the river uh, from DC in Arlington. And they have two unregistered earn and learn programs. And one is for high school students. I don't know if you'd really call that an apprenticeship. But they had this, I, I love this because two basically technicians in the, in the Arlington Mercedes service department built their own little apprenticeship program from the ground up, you know, sort of grow your own apprenticeship. Um, and it's one of the most interesting of all the four I looked at because it has a very structured on the job piece. And, you know, the lesson for me there that was so interesting is, you know, you, this is, doesn't have to be complicated. You know, you can, you can do this at home. Um, so, um, you know, quick few top lines of what we learned from these programs. Um, you know, number one, the employers we, we talked to were really unanimous in explaining why they chose unregistered rather than registered. And the answer was flexibility to meet business needs, right? Um, technology is changing. You know, you need different machines this year than last year. Skill shortages are pressing. Uh, firms need to train and retrain fast. Jobs are more specialized sometimes than the registered apprenticeship program, um, you know, that's on the shelf that you can, that you can uh, develop. Uh, sometimes the jobs are more specialized and sometimes the jobs, you need multi-skills. You need a guy who can um, do electrical and mechanical systems and it's hard to develop a program like that, you know, unless you can be fast and nimble and do it yourself. Um, so, but, so that's number one, you know, big top line is they want the flexibility and you just heard that over and over and over and over, and over again at every company. Um, number two, much as they prize that flexibility, um, they all did understand that they needed to structure their program with external standards. And there wasn't a program we looked at or talked to or whatever that didn't have a constant and reliable set of skills standards, basically externally developed. I mean, the one at Fame came up out of Toyota, but for most of the other, th for all the 300 other companies, it's external. And um, the, um, for all the others, they, they took something off the shelf that either associated the, um, the, the um, Automotive Service Excellence Education Foundation had developed, or the National Center for Construction Education and Research had developed, or the Association for Perioperative Nurses had developed, and nobody made it up by themselves. <laughs> um, and that was uh, really interesting. You know, in Europe, uh, in, in, in Germany and England and other countries, I mean, I shouldn't say Europe, other countries, um, it's usually a centralized office that develops these standards or at least coordinates them uh, with employer input. In America, you know, who's surprised, read your Tocqueville, it's voluntary associations. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really interesting, these voluntary associations, again, Trump calls them certifiers, their industry voluntary associations are developing the standards. Um, number three, um, kind of top line, um, the employer's question were also, again, unanimous. I mean, it was surprising how much the opinion was common that the most important part of the program is the on-the-job part, <laughs> right? Like the classroom part is nice, everybody has to be in a classroom, but the real learning takes place in the workplace. And in the programs we looked at, rarely more than 25% of the time was in the classroom. So, you know, people sometimes think it's half and half or two days and three days. Most of the programs we looked at, a lot more time on the job. 
Now, structuring that OJT can be a challenge, right? And I think that's one of the things that needs a lot more attention. Your little company out there, you know, how well can they figure out how to structure that, um, that OJT? And it's very, the quality is very mixed in my view. But so that is something where I think we need to do more work. Um, but number four, you know, the number one challenge um, for registered and unregistered apprenticeship really is how does a small company do it? And so what we found out there is there's, a, you know, they people, again, people figure these things out, right? We don't have to tell them. They form collectives. <laughs> and sometimes it was an official collective like FAME. Sometimes it was the industry association was effectively your collective. They all kind of lean back on collectives. So... Um, Bob talked about our recommendations. Maybe I'll just say a couple words about where I, uh, little, some glosses and a little bit, few differences, and I'll do it quickly. You know, the building the brand, you know, that sounds like a hard thing. Like, how would we get a third of the, um, uh, imagine a third of high school students say apprenticeship rather than, um, than, than college. I mean, that would be amazing. But the interesting thing is England did it. Like England in the last decade went from like it wasn't a brand to now it is a brand. So it's doable to create a brand. You know, it sounds hard, but it's doable. We've seen another country do it, you know, basically overnight, 10 years, it's nothing. Um, the second recommendation, the skills standards. Again, this is where Bob and I differed a little bit. And, um, you know, Bob was more looking to the kind of central body, a private public central body, working with employers, and I am really excited about the, the possibility of the more decentralized um, employer groups doing it. And there does have to, obviously have to be quality control, and, um, but I, I'm not worried about having too many standards. You know, the, the, the Trump administration, one of its early documents was worried about what if we have too many sets of standards in one occupation. That's a marketplace. That's good. Then employers can pick which one they want, and the best ones will eventually come out. So I sort of believe in in markets <laughs> and, and, and volunteerism and, and letting um, a thousand flowers bloom and, and then, then there'll be a shakeout. And the paper recommends experimenting with both approaches. We agreed to disagree and <laughs> um, you know, let's try both and see what works. Throw the spaghetti at the wall. Um, on the government funding, you know, I'm a Republican. I had to think long and hard about that. We recommended spending a lot of money. Um, but uh, in the end, I do agree with Bob. You know, we'll never um, build a respected brand or expand it on the scale that's needed without government money. And it's got to be a mix, right? We're not going to let employers off the hook. The employers have to do their part, developing the programs and structuring the on-the-job learning and training the trainers, you know, really hard part, and paying the wages. But I think it does make sense to basically take a leave from Germany and let the government pay for the part when they're in school. Uh, or, you know, off-job training, as Bob calls it. Um, and then the intermediaries, I'm all for that. Uh, no complaints, really. Quality control, again, Bob and I differed a little bit. Um, although, again, I think in the end we agreed that both approaches are a good idea. Um, he favors end-of-program student assessments by third parties. And obviously a lot of the certifiers do do that. That's what they do. You study and then you go take the test. And, you know, in ASC you go to a training center and you have to put your phone in a locker and you go and you take a test and you come out and it figures out whether you know what you know. It's not quite at the end of the apprenticeship, but it's along the way. Um, so um, I'm all for that. I think that's a good idea. But I also think we should um, think about outcomes. You know, do people get better jobs? Do people get better wages? Hard to figure out. But, you know, taking the test is nice, but in the end, I'd like to see an outcomes-based um, uh, kind of yardstick as well. So that's a... Well, good question. Um, I mean, the government's not actually paying the employers, right? The government's paying, in our scheme of things, the government's paying to, helping to pay to create the standards and then paying for the community college. But yes, they would ultimately, maybe they linked in some way. Um, good question. We didn't really think that through. Um, so that's what's in the report. And now I'm going to give the leadership back to Eric to, um, to, to lead, lead us a fearless leader. Okay, great. Well, thank you, thank you very much. And um, Bob, and uh, I'm going to be joined by our discussant. You're now not a moderator panel anymore. Brent Parton uh, is going to join me up here. Uh, Brent is the assistant director of the Center for Education and Skills at New America, uh, right down the street here. And Bob and Tamar are going to stay up here. And um, we have less of a panel and more of discussants on this. Um, 
We, yeah, we did. Um, so, so well, let's give um, Gardner his due. Gardner Carrick from the Manufacturing Institute was supposed to be here, and he wasn't um, intimidated by the snow. His plane, um, had, the plane got canceled, and he had to take an earlier plane. So we right. We're sorry he couldn't join us. Would have been another good opinion to have here. So, so the first, you know, part of this report does talk about the recommendations that they reviewed. The second half, you know, are some really good drilling down case studies, right? And, I learned a lot from those case studies, and it was they were they're very detailed and really gives you a glimpse of what they're like. So, it's it's interesting to see that all four of those programs you notified you mentioned in the case studies developed on their own. Employer need wasn't a government program or a grant necessarily driving those things at all. Um, it was supply and demand and employer need, and I think they all benefit both the employers and the workers. And I think when we talk about apprenticeship, you know, we have to have. <clears throat> And for our conversation today, what I really want to be the differentiator here is quality, right? High quality programs. Um, as many of us see as we travel across the country, a lot of people call things apprenticeship that are not apprenticeships, or at least defined by four or five components of on, paid on the job learning, mentorship, supervision, earning a credential at the end, um, uh, uh, and related technical instruction. Um, We've all seen programs that are for a month or two um, or two or three weeks and somebody calls them an apprenticeship, right? So we need to bring some discipline with that and I think the conversation about high quality is very important. So um, I want to get some of Brent's reaction to the paper generally and then I think we both want to ask questions and drill down and have a conversation. Towards the end of this conversation, we'll open it up for questions from you guys within the last, from our studio audience, sorry for you folks at home. Um, uh, and, and we'll get a conversation going with the group here because I'm sure there's plenty of questions. So, um, so I have a lot of questions in my mind, but I'll get those together. But until I'm getting those together, let me go to uh, Brent Parton with New American. And Brent, just you, you've seen the report. You've been working in this space. What are some of your initial reactions to the paper and the report? And then we'll drill down with some more specific questions as we go through. Sure. First off, thank you guys uh, for the opportunity to comment on this. More importantly, a really great report. Incredible work, apprenticeship. It's a it's a broad landscape. Even if you're talking about just one of those segments, to do so to try to cover the the broad wilderness unknown of programs that are even outside of the registered system is a real accomplishment. So I do want to congratulate you on that, and it's a great contribution to what is a exciting debate about what's going on with apprenticeship in the United States and its potential. Uh, overall, I thought it put its finger on what is really the most important issue, which whether you're talking about registered apprenticeship or unregistered apprenticeship is that if we want to grow quality experiences in the United States, there's no realistic path to scale through the current road we're on. And in particular, what I mean by that is the retail single employer registering one program at a time approach or one employer in the case studies, which are remarkable examples, but relying on each employer to individually build the capacity, get bit by the bug and want to develop a program, it's going to be a, a slow road. And if we look at international examples, what we can clearly see is industry-wide understandings or occupational frameworks of what are sort of safe harbors or baselines to start building programs from. From a practitioner standpoint, you could call it a template. Uh, from a policymaker standpoint, it could be kind of like a safe harbor idea of building if you're going to not have to start from scratch as an employer. More importantly, I though, arguably building on what we know in workforce development in the United States is that it's done best through a sector approach, and that's a multi-employer approach. So getting us out of the trap of sort of, again, one employer, one program, a few apprentices at a time is just going to be a, a, a universal challenge that we have to overcome, and I thought your recommendations were really put your finger on that and, and also saying that it's not just a registered problem, it's a problem in the broader apprenticeship space. Setting up an apprenticeship can be hard. Um, and we can focus on the paperwork for registration, but I would argue that even the more challenging thing is that it's unfamiliar and new to a lot of employers. Uh, and so that process of working with employers to train the trainer, build out competencies, um, recruit apprentices, how you do that is a lot of work. And so employers should not be on their own to do that. So again, that second point of intermediaries, the concept that someone is out there to handhold uh, the employers that are ready to help them facilitate multi-employer programs. So again, this dual focus that I saw very clearly in the recommendations around 
how do we build more industry-wide occupational or occupationally uh, defined starting points for employers at the same time how do we build capacity on the ground whether that's how south carolina did it which is kind of the darling in many respects of the american system where you have uh, consultants based throughout a region often embedded at a community college that will work with employers from soup to nuts to build the program so intermediaries and competency frameworks i really really resonated um interestingly though i mean i think that you know how we think about then what's the role of government in supporting that work does raise a new question, which is this question of quality, which I think is what a lot of our, as Eric wants our, our question, to, our discussion to focus on. Um, you know, un, it would be great if policies and regulations were focused on promoting more good actors. They're usually focused, though, on preventing bad actors. And um, I, I, I guess I'll adopt that more cynical point of view from the standpoint of the discussion today to kind of get us going and have some fun with it. But the brand of apprenticeship is incredibly important. Um, it's arguably, if you look at our broader higher education system today, it's one of the few certain bets left out there um, in the sense that you know people can don't take out debt. They get paid work-based learning. They also know that what they're, the skills they're building are related to a job, to a career, to an industry. There's room for tremendous improvement. We don't have enough data on the outcomes of programs. But overall, the brand of apprenticeship, that it means something, it means something in terms of arguably like a square deal for between the worker and the employer is something that's very important. Um, so when the government is going to get involved with supporting occupational frameworks, with supporting intermediaries to grow programs, it has to particularly take the standpoint of whose interest does it need to look out for. And I would argue that you know when it comes to sort of apprenticeship programs, we would want to make sure whether they're unregistered, registered, that we're meeting certain quality tests. And I thought the paper touches on a few of those. Um, I think the idea, uh, I, the, the linkages between ensuring programs are tied to occupations with good wages and good careers is a no-brainer. Uh, if the government is going to support the related instruction or the classroom-based training, let's make sure that the occupations and jobs that it's supporting are actually ones with a career trajectory or people are being rewarded for building new skills. Um, but also the central question, I liked how the paper dove into the question around future of work and not all of us are going to be with the same employer all the time anymore. So this issue of permeability and ensuring that at the end of a program, someone's receiving a credential in the registered system would be the journey card. Um, but even outside of that, is the credential that sort of serves as the capstone for the experience something that's truly recognized and relatable across the landscape with a, of employers within an industry so that the idea of the apprentice is not tied to any one employer necessarily but really is valued across an industry so I, I would I would encourage and I want to hear more about sort of your thinking on that how do we ensure that what permeability looks like in our in our system because that ties back to this question large part of how these other systems are organized is that the reason apprentices are in related instruction was always to balance the firm specific training with the broader occupational training. And that's something that's very old in apprenticeship, but very important from the standpoint of the worker's interest. OK, Brent, I'm asking the questions here, OK? Um, <laughs> so a, a couple of things. Um, uh, and I, and I want to sort of follow up on your questions and throw something else out on the table. So um, apprenticeship is not the solution for every workforce problem out there, right? There's a range of workforce uh, solutions that have been going on for years in this country. Industry sector initiatives, career pathways, individual programs at community college, high school career and technology ed programs, a, a wide range of them. I would argue that many of them are difficult to put together, similarly difficult as apprenticeship. Um, uh, uh, so, you know, I, I think there are challenges in putting them together for employers. Um, what is great about your paper is all of those programs I mentioned, they're all employer driven and you, all, you make the point again and again that employers are in the driver's seat here in a number of ways. We know that the registered system clearly outlines in statute um, and regulations that apprenticeship has to look out for the welfare of the apprentice um, and is also looking out for the employer's skill needs. So balancing the needs of the apprentice and the employer, and I think there could be you know, some real questions about, gee, is, these, is the new proposal from the Department of Labor meeting the employer needs or is it meeting the worker needs or is it doing both? So that's, that's a discussion I think we need to have. But I think the, the elephant in the room is, are we headed towards two systems of apprenticeship in this country? I mean, is, is that where we are? Um, branding makes that complicated. 
Um, some of the recommendations complicate. So, so tomorrow, let me just start with you. Is that where we're headed for two systems? Yeah, really good system question. Program? I mean, we do recommend at the end that our recommendations be applied across the board and it be united in one system. I think I'll, I'll, you know, Bob's idea of incrementalism toward a vision. You know, one system is probably down the road, and when you get when you ask for one system, it's going to mean giving up some of the ways that are d things that are done now, and you know, who's going to who's going to give up. You know, and how is that going to meld? I don't know. But I think the goal obviously has to be uh, one vision. Um, yeah. uh, Bob, your thoughts on that? Well, um, California, uh, a few months ago, uh, decided to separate its program for construction and firefighters uh, from all the other occupations. Um, now, that wasn't entirely an accident because the one system we have had has been very construction driven um, in a lot of states they play a huge role in the state apprenticeship agency in deciding what is or should be counted as an apprenticeship the unions do unions and non-union uh, companies so um, I think we have had in a way uh, uh, two systems uh, in that sense. Uh, one that's quite large, mainly in commercial and industrial construction, and one that's a smattering of other fields. If you look at all the other industries where we have data, and unfortunately we don't even have data from a lot of states, you'll see there's, they're very relatively small numbers uh, compared to construction. So we have had that. Now, I do agree that we want to move toward uh, a unified system. But it doesn't have to be done immediately mm -hmm. uh, to the extent that there, there's pushback because uh, the construction people feel that their program is already working and why, why mess with it? OK. Um, construction unions feel that. Huh? Construction union feels, feels that, not, not well, some Well, some, some of the non-union employers do, too. So, um, but, uh, you know, ultimately, I think as the system matures, it would converge into, into one system. So I just want to go on record as strongly opposing the construction exclusion from the Trump initiative. Um, the, uh, in unregistered, construction is the majority of registered apprenticeship, but it's also a huge part of registered, uh, excuse me, other way around. Construction is a huge part of the registered apprenticeship program, but it's also a huge part of unregistered mm -hmm. landscape. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, two systems for a while is fine, but I don't think it should be two systems that leaves anybody out or two systems that are untreated differently. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to the degree that we're going to have subsidies and to the degree that we're going to pay for stuff, I think we should be, go down the road right away of as start to pay, we should be paying for, for, for both. <laughs> and, and the privileges should be applied fairly and equally to both. Okay. I'm going to pivot just a little bit here. Um, Brent mentioned uh, you know, concern for bad actors. You, your case studies are for really high quality programs, really good programs. Um, uh, in the registration system in the U.S., if, if uh, you have a bad actor or an incompetent provider or incompetent apprenticeship program, there is a process for disbarring that or removing them or declassifying, deregistering those programs. So let's talk about oversight and governance for a minute, whether it relates to your four case studies or non-registered program. If there are bad actors, if there are, and I've been in the workforce system long enough to know that there's a lot of programs out there that are outstanding and several programs that are uh, the, 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 the rarity, but many programs that are not good for either the worker or the company. So what is the oversight and governance role for bad actors on non-registered programs? How, uh, how can companies, how can workers, how can parents, how can um, employers or, or even local consumer agencies have an understanding whether it's a good or bad program? Yeah, so I think that's a really good question. And, um, you know, we did try to give some thought to that in our outcomes recommendation. You know, we strongly believe we're not, we shouldn't, I don't want to pay a dime of taxpayer money for something that's not quality. <laughs> and, um, but, you know, if you think about 
what the money would – who would the money go to, right, in our system? It would go to some degree to the intermediaries. But if the, med- if the intermediaries turned out to not be that good, um, you know, maybe not that many companies would look to them. I mean, in, in a way, the intermediaries are more likely to be the corrupt bad actors than anybody else, right? The companies aren't getting any money. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, if you're a company and you're going to start a whole apprenticeship and go down this road, why would you do it badly? You know, you want trained workers, right? You're, and you're not getting any money for it. So I'm not too worried about the companies being bad actors. I mean, of course, there has to be – we do have to look at outcomes. And if it looks like they're bad act- actors, we have to – I don't know what we do to them because they're not – you can't cut them off from funds. We just have to say we don't like you or something. <laughs> um, but um, the – certifiers and the intermediaries, I think the marketplace would also help weed them out. I mean, if, you're, so if your standards aren't good and useful and don't reflect um, the industry skills, the industry is going to figure it out and people are not going to use them. I mean, these are companies. They have, a, they have everything is on the line for this. So I think the market accountability, I don't think it's enough, but I think it's more important than maybe, you know, we're letting on or thinking about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um. So in, in the UK, they do have an auditing group that audits uh, these uh, training organizations that market and do the off-site training for apprenticeships. Um, and um, if they are class, and, and they have various classifications, and if you don't meet that standard uh, in a particular year, uh, they'll give you maybe one year to clean up your act. Uh, and then you're, you're, you're out of the system of getting funded. Now, let's remember that, so far anyway, uh, in the U.S. we don't require companies to do any training if they don't want to. Mm-hmm. We don't require them to have long training programs or short training programs. We don't require them to even uh, have a program that meets what we would call an apprenticeship before using the term apprenticeship in England. It's copyrighted and you can't just use that term uh, for uh, a bogus program. But I do think that, uh, especially if there's some government funding associated with it, uh, we need a system that assures a certain level of credibility. And yes, the market will, I'm I'm a very pro-market economist, but in the meantime, there are People that are making decisions, and you know, there it, it is valuable for a young worker uh, to know uh, that this program has some sort of credibility. Um, and finally, I do think that the portability element is very critical for the worker. And let's be clear that this initiative, in my opinion, has to be. Good for the workers as good as well as good for the companies. Can I just say something about the portability for a second? Sure. Add something. I mean, so I don't think, maybe I don't emphasize enough, you know, the people, the certifiers, right? Who are the certifiers in the current system? Not the Trump, what Trump envisions, but right now, who's coming up with those standards are mostly industry associations, right? And they have members and they, so they, they aren't just, these standards aren't for one company. When you get an uh, NCCER card, you can take it anywhere in the construction industry. And when, presumably, when you get a Periot nurses certification from the you know that organization you can take it anywhere and you can take an ASE so I mean it's not like what's happening out there is you're just getting like Toyota said you're good although when Toyota says you're good you're pretty good but you're not just getting tomorrow's widgets say you're good you're getting the industry association so I think you know it's sure we have to guard against programs that don't have portability but the existing uh, independent pr- programs mostly do have very wide portability, or a lot of certainly ones we looked at. Yeah, and, and I think that's kind of part of the question. I mean, we're all in this room. We look at workforce development. I think we can argue that the universe of credentials, well, <laughs> there's sure. entire organizations sure. in this space, is not clean. No. And so I think those are great examples of areas where there are opportunities, and I, I would argue those would meet certain standards of what portability looks like. But it does come back to this broader question of you know it's easy to say, oh, there's going to be bad actors out there, and no, the government needs to overregulate things. That's not necessarily what I'm getting at. What I am saying is, you know, we want more employer-based training wholesale. It's, it's, it's good for workers to get. But if the government is going to invest money in it, we have to meet a standard of, one, what does good look like? 
And that's something that I think people who participate in apprenticeship programs, the point of a trademark, they expect certain things out of it. I'm talking basics around yeah, yeah. paid work-based learning, things like that. So how do we do that? And then the second part is I think we have a real opportunity when to do that, to create this sort of integrated system to look at outcomes and to say if the government is getting involved for policy reasons, we're trying to advance some policy objectives, to be honest. We're trying to create another pathway for people. And so who are these programs working for is another part of it too. So I would be thinking in part, you know, what types of populations, you know, are we looking at outcomes broken out uh, by certain groups, race, gender, looking at those types of things. We have the ability to do that if we do move towards sort of a broader system that's outcomes driven, but that does require some level of we are looking at a certain type of program that meets certain types of basic parameters. So Brent, I want to come back to you for this question, uh, and then I'll go down the line a little bit. Um, so what is the right policy, right? There's a lot of ideas that are laid out in the paper. Is it funding? Is it a tax credit? Is it branding? Um, what are the right, what is the right policy or a set of right policies? And how do we get more companies involved? What is it that's going to bring companies to the table? Certainly they're not going to watch this. Uh, there's some great <laughs> examples that they can draw on. Uh, there's some great examples they can draw on from Union programs, other non-registered, IT, Fairview, um, uh, fame, uh, so there's plenty of models out there, but as a matter of policy, what's going to get more employers involved? I'll start and please jump in more, but um, I actually Bob mentioned an interesting example, California, and it brings up this question of what do we mean by apprenticeship system? We Right now we're very focused on is it registered or not? which is just a part of the system in my view. A real system is gonna have a model of infrastructure that includes the intermediaries that are out there working with individual employers, that includes people that can develop kind of broader occupational frameworks that can serve as starting points and templates. Those are elements of a system that the registered apprenticeship system, which is really meant, was designed in the early part of the 20th century for a very narrow purpose, which is to look after workers to make sure the apprentice wasn't exploited. It didn't have a role in expanding the system. We actually built a private apprenticeship system versus places like Germany and Switzerland and that we expected labor unions and large employers to organize the rest of the system themselves. So where are there a lot of apprenticeships in the United States? It's in areas where they've built that infrastructure and system. So the question is for industries like healthcare, for industries like information technology, I would say, yeah, non-union construction falls in this area too. How can the government build infrastructure or support the infrastructure in those non-traditional industries to match but look a little different than what we have where we have more established apprenticeships? I think that means investing in like California has done, not creating two systems, but in creating a mechanism for non-traditional industries to get their programs approved, that doesn't mean they have to go through similar processes as maybe people that have certain knowledge and experience with other types of programs. That means investing in intermediaries that can include community colleges, sector partnerships, all the different work, workforce boards, regional partnerships. I think we need to continue to do that. And I think creating safe harbors to truly modernize the registered apprenticeship system could be very powerful for setting ideas of what are the types of careers and jobs and what are the starting points for employers that want to sign on and adopt programs. And you can tie some incentives to that for the related instruction, I think. I, ju I just wanted to uh, let, I, I agree with uh, what Brent said and uh, what Tamar has said. Uh, but in terms of the intermediaries, um, what we've been doing so far is providing grants. And those grants are to organizations that win a proposal competition where they promise to create certain numbers of apprenticeships. And that can often be uh, disappointing. Uh, it seems to me that uh, our grants for the intermediaries may be a little bit for infrastructure, but mostly should be on a performance-based uh, reward system. That is, if you don't create any apprenticeships, <laughs> you don't get the money. Now, that will push them to create more apprenticeships, and that's why having that basic level of what an apprenticeship should be and defining that is is a critical element it seems to me those two things go together if you're going to reward organization to create apprenticeships it has to be an apprenticeship that we have somehow have judged at least from the point of view of reimbursement <coughs> uh, 
uh, adequate quality. That doesn't mean companies can't do their own separately. But if there is some government uh, support, it should be uh, in that performance-based, but toward some quality system. So I'm going to um, you know, say something I... Surprise! I'm going to say, but um, you know, I think you know the Trump approach. I don't know if they're going to pull it off, but I think it has a lot of promise. I mean, I think the vision that this is the independent certifiers and that they are basically industry groups, you know, rely on the sort of Tocqueville tradition of voluntary kind of associations. I think they should get money to develop standards, and we should regulate the heck out of them. You know, if the standards aren't good, end of the money, performance-based, I love it. Um, you know, we, we can be all over them. Um, but I don't think we should be all over the employers. I think the reason the employers want to be outside the registered system is they don't want the government <laughs> regulating them. And we're not giving them money, so I don't think it's – we need to regulate them in the same way. But if the standards are good, if the certifiers – we need to make sure that the certifiers have a base. If they don't have any customers, if nobody using their standards, end of the money, right? Like, what would be the point? You know, nice on the shelf, great, but you need a base. And the, and the outcomes of the base need to be good. I mean, that's where I think the outcomes come in. Are those people in your base producing people that get good jobs? And the, and the, the industry bodies can track that. You know, NCCR, they have cards, you know, and they have people in a registry, and they know whether people get jobs on better wages. So they can track, they can have bureaucracy, they can have the paperwork, we can audit the heck out of them. But then the employers, you know, get the benefit of that, and they get the, um, they get the, if we pay for the, for the classroom learning, we're paying a quarter or a third of the cost, maybe, of training their workers. Employers are going to, that's going to be attractive to employers once they figure it out. And the other thing is, you know, employers, my experience with employers is what they, what they the people they, other people they trust and the people they're likely to learn from and the people they're like, are other employers. <laughs> so if it's their industry group saying here's something, they're going to trust it a lot more than if it comes from Washington. So... Before I do that, let's just be clear. So there is an industry-recognized apprenticeship program proposal. There are no regulations around it yet. The Department of Labor is working on them. Uh, there is not a program today. I get asked the question all, all over the place. <laughs> they go, oh, we're going to do an IRAP program. There is not a policy in place by the federal government. And they may or may not pull it off. session on this, but just a few comments on ensuring not only diversity and attracting populations, but equity and, and uh, allowing folks who have not traditionally been served by apprenticeship to advance with different employers. Just real quickly, uh, don't want to take a shot at that. Yeah, I think this comes back to the question of, you know, if, what again, if the government is going to invest in these programs, this is an opportunity to push leverage on a couple of very clear policy objectives. I would... I would argue, and that you know, you look at the data that there's a lot of room for diversity and improving equity within existing registered apprenticeship programs. We don't be interested in what you saw from the data that you've looked at or the examples on unregistered side, but public investment should mean that we're not just creating another option. Going back to the vision here, not creating another option for people who didn't necessarily need another option. You know, the mainstream higher ed pathway is working pretty well for you know a certain segment of society and not well for people of color. And so if we're going to be able to create other options, it's an opportunity for us to be thinking as a country how to embed equity and how what building a new pathway, a new apprenticeship option looks like, and guarding against things like occupational segregation so that women are not just pushed into certain occupations or certain sort of lower road careers are not the ones that are more available or there's over concentration of people of, people of color in those pathways. So as I said, uh, I believe in mainstream programs with a hidden agenda. Uh, I think we should make sure that the program is available to them, to anybody, and that they should even involve things like engineering and a whole range of things. I think the diversity will arise when the occupational range of apprenticeship becomes very wide, so that when we have child care workers, when we have retail, when we have a whole range of things, including things today, even like pharmacy tech 
Okay, that was not an apprenticeship before. Now it is. And you can see right there, there's massive amounts of the kind of diversity in race and sex that we had uh, been concerned about. So I think that I wouldn't try to do it in a, in a hugely direct way. I would try to do it in a much more indirect way. We have to uh, certainly uh, apply existing laws uh, about equal opportunity. Um, and, you know, we might have some additional uh, subsidy for reaching out to underserved populations by the uh, uh, by those uh, people who are selling organizing. So um, I don't know if this is enough in the long run, but um, the companies I've the companies the four companies I visited for this um, report, but all the other companies I you know see and I see a lot, they're desperate for diversity, <laughs> and not because they necessarily want to look good to the customers, although that's often a reason, but because, you know, guess what? Half the workers are actually women, you know, and a lot of the workers are people of color. And, I mean, I haven't come across a company that isn't, uh, or, 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 uh, or a career training program of any kind that isn't desperate to get more women in and, and, and be more diverse. So I'm not sure, again, in the end, I mean, I kind of like Bob's idea of indirect, and I don't think I don't want to be naive about any of these things and say it'll all work out. But um, certainly, what I've seen is there's a there's a natural imperative for that that's that is apart from a sort of regulatory policy imperative. Um, one more time for some questions from our vast studio audience. Uh, I can't see you all the way to the end. Who you are and who you're with. And asking about what is the role of states in an in a industry recognized system, and to uh, provide a little bit more detail on who were the recipients of funding. Whatever. Yeah, really um, good question about the states. I haven't thought about that. And I mean, I'm a bit, you know, states. States are much better when it comes from the state than when it comes from Washington, you know, for anybody out in the real world. And so I have to think a little more about that. But maybe it is about um, figuring out who's good, who's quality, who has markets, marketing it in the, you know, employers do listen to what happens in the state and creating incentives and creating models. I mean, I do need to, th I, don't, I don't have a worked out answer, but it's a really good question and we need to think about it more. Um, my thing, my vision of the certifiers and the, um, and the intermediaries is there would be separate pots of separate streams of money, but I would expect the employer associations who create the the standards to also get in the game of being the intermediaries because again they're the people you know if you're the roofer association you're creating the curriculum but you also know all the roofers <laughs> and when you say as the roofing association uh, you know apprenticeship is a really good idea and you need more qualified workers and you need to upgrade the quality of the jobs the roofers are going to listen to you as opposed to when some paid nonprofit comes and do it does it so my instinct is there should be separate streams of money and they should be you know, rated on how well they each do their job. Do the standards have buyers? Have you, as an intermediary, recruited a lot of people? But I wouldn't be surprised if the same bodies ended up doing a lot of it. And I would just, one thing on the state point, um, you all have mentioned, which I think is a great point, of the ambition of high school students, cohorts of high school students, much larger numbers, making decisions to do apprenticeship. Um, that's going to take integration with our formal education system. Those decisions about what a young person does before they leave high school get made years before their senior year or junior year. State, working with states to inter integrate apprenticeship as an option for high school students, building youth apprenticeship programs, but also the higher education role. A lot of these intermediaries, potentially intermediaries, work for sports, community colleges, 
a lot of the tuition waivers that exist, for example, for registered apprenticeship are things that are run through states. So states actually, I think, do play a huge role, both in policy alignment, but also how this new system would interact with the existing apprenticeship system. Yeah, we could run the, um, the off-job subsidy, we, when we do this. We could run, we could run the off-job subsidy through states. Yeah, Brent uh, mentioned about high schools. I mean, one good thing about starting in high schools and, say, using uh, career academies, C good CTE programs, is that um, the off-job training is an entitlement. The government's already paying for the high school education, and in, that's why in Switzerland and in Germany, there's no particular issue because they're getting their apprenticeships in late high school, which they would get funding for anyway, even if they weren't in academic high school or a uh, career-focused uh, program. So there's nothing that would stop states from doing that right now. Uh, also, there was nothing that would stop states and could be encouraged from uh, rewarding uh, those community colleges that uh, create credit-bearing apprenticeship programs from continuing to get their state subsidies, their per capita state subsidies. So there's plenty of role for the states. We didn't cover it in this document. We didn't cover everything. But um, I think ambitious states could play a huge role. Other questions? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, who are you and who are you with? Now, let's get you a microphone. Do we have another? Oh, we only have. Uh, Jason Turner from the uh, Secretary's Innovation Group. You know, I think this branding thing is very important. I agree with you. And I would like uh, to address this to um, Brent, uh, who's from New America Foundation. So you're center left, your organization is. Uh, I'm center right. And uh, um, I noted that the National Skills Coalition, for example, uh, opposed the uh, House uh, work program for food stamp recipients in the recent uh, in the recent discussions. So here's my question: um, How I, I tend to think that if the supply of if the demand for apprenticeships comes forth from those who want to accept one, the supply would solve itself one way or another. The problem I see is we have uh, insufficient demand, and the insufficient demand is partly related to opposition by the traditional public school systems, also parents, also um, counselors in schools, and the unions. So there's, there's no natural uh, constituency encouraging students in high school to take apprenticeships or, or, or branding them. So here's my question for you. How could... Um, Democrats and generally on the left support school-based apprenticeship branding. Could it be through the National Education Association? That would be one way to do it. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Good question. And when you say demand, you mean from students, parents, that end. Okay. So, uh, two, two quick things, and please jump in on this as well. Uh, we actually did focus group work uh, over 2017, part of a report that we put out called Youth Apprenticeship in America Today. We did it with students and parents, and we tried to dig into what was behind perceptions of these issues. Um, interestingly, actually, when you put what an apprenticeship is in front of a student or a parent, which you're seeing as paid work-based learning, no debt college, you're seeing a pretty good deal. And students and parents react to that. Their question what their pushback is, is, is this a dead end? Is this something that will stop my kid out? Will their options narrow because of this? So for us, that's a positive. That's a, just a program design issue. So this issue around can we start youth apprenticeships that have credit, college credit bearing, that immediately shifts people's perception that these are stop out alternatives to college versus this seems like a lot better deal to get to and through college. We should not underestimate the anxieties around the cost of higher education that parents and students are facing and the concerns of irrelevance, that even if I finish, do I have a career on the other side? Those are prominent. We have a window of opportunity to have this conversation, but we have to make sure that the design of the programs reflect what that demand is. So I think that apprenticeship is one of the most powerful learning methods we have. 
I think people value it. We should ensure the higher education system recognizes and values on the job learning, gives real transferable credit, and I think we can bite a lot of that back about this idea that you're, 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 you were one of those kids. You didn't make it through. And so that's what we found in our research when with what we've been kind just, of Just one with, quick yeah. point. I, I strongly disagree that the problem is too few people want to do apprenticeships. We have too few apprenticeship offers. Um, and I believe that there is a counseling issue and there are some issues. But once you have one cohort in a local high school or local area going through quality apprenticeships, they're going to tell their brothers and sisters, friends, and so on, hey, we're doing something interesting. We're actually producing something. We're getting paid. We're not sitting in a classroom all day. I have a truck. I mean, that. that and a house. <laughs> I bought a truck and a house. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's going to resonate with a very large number of young people. And um, I think it, that is, that's, I think, a, a smaller problem so than getting in Community college is not apprenticeship. So, you don't get paid to go to a community college. You pay. You don't, you don't, ha, huh? That's a non -credit. Uh, some of them are non-credit. You don't, uh, you aren't, I mean, in an apprenticeship, you have one mentor for every, a few, a couple of students. In a community college, you have one for 500. So it's, it's a totally different situation to think of community colleges. An apprenticeship is the same thing. So I think um, the, the tide is starting to turn on the sort of college for all mentality. Um, I think, you know, it's definitely true that the last 20, 30 years, America as a nation has tried to convince people that the only route to success is, is academic college. And I think that's still what most of us think our kids should do and most of the people we have dinner, go to dinner parties with think they should do. Um, but I think the tide is starting to turn and more and more people are realizing that apprenticeship in particular but also other kinds of, for want of a better word, career education, workforce education are valuable and a good idea. Apprenticeship is the you know, um, Eric said this early, earlier, but it maybe bears repeating. Apprenticeship is sort of the Maserati of career education. There are a lot of people who can only afford a, a Model T, and we need to encourage those Model Ts too. And the more the Model Ts look like the Maseratis, you know, incorporate the principles of apprenticeship, the better off we're going to be. But I think the tide is turning on a lot of it. And more and more families are saying, and more and more kids are seeing success, as Bob points out, and thinking that maybe it's a good idea. But I think, you know, the government, it's a role for the president. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, this president and future presidents should be talking about it, and governors should be talking about it, and counselors need to change. I mean, we've got to work on it. Absolutely. Great deal of discussion about the workforce and skills for the future. One more question from our friend at the Swiss Embassy, Simon Marty, and then we're going to have to move on. Thank you very Give a microphone. Uh, it's, oh. it's fine. No, no, not for the live speaker. You can, no matter how loud you speak. Thanks for already introducing me. I'm from the Swiss Embassy, Simon Marty. I, um, if you allow, I can also uh, reply a little bit to that question from from our work with, yeah, with Swiss companies. seconds left, so. And question, okay, I first asked the question. And um, when you were studying the non-registered apprenticeships, what did you see in terms of difference between employers participating in or creating non-registered apprenticeship compared to the registered ones in terms of their uh, ROI calculation? Because I asked that because in Switzerland it. Our economists think that the ROI really plays a key role. While why companies will participate, and in, in our country, it's about between 35 and 40 percent of all employers participate. So the idea is basically, economists' idea is basically that it is because they see a positive ROI. So what kind of difference did you see there? Yeah, um, good question. I'm not sure I can answer it. I think. I mean, I think they see the, again, what they all talk about is the flexibility. We can, we can take this and do it our way. The government can't tell me how to train my workers better than I know how to train my workers. So I think they see more ROI because they see less, for want of a better word, friction. Um, you know, if you have to spend a lot of your time dealing with some government office, that cuts into your ROI. <laughs> and if you can just get it from the guy you trust at your trade association and then figure out how to do it in a way that works for you, I think it actually, ups your sense of ROI. I don't know if I can, you know, I'm not, sh I'm not sure that's always true. And a lot of the programs, um, a lot of companies, several of the companies in the case studies have both. 
or employers. Certainly Fairview has both, Chinbro has both, um, Mercedes has both, you know, has both. Um, and I think, um, you know, they do the registered because they get certain privileges out of it. The, for, if you're a construction contractor, you get Davis-Bacon wage rules. And if you're, you know, you get some, you get, you get various things out of the registered programs. So that adds to your, to the positives. But, you know, if, the, if we were going to be fair about the privileges, um, then, you know, it's hard to know how they calculate. So we're going to have to wrap this session up. Um, I'm going to want to leave with two lingering questions, though, which we didn't have time to get to today, hopefully in your next session of the employers, which I'm really looking forward to. But um, I think oversight and governance remain two key critical issues for the new proposals and whatever DOL is working on in terms of their process. And the other question, which I would love to talk more about here, is how are we going to know these industry-recognized programs are working? Um, we have a hard enough time trying to, to obtain data on our current registered system that's been around for 80 years. So how do we know if these new programs are working and if it's a good policy to go on anyway? The suggestion of pilots, that we have some good examples coming here. So that remains, I think, a key question for the future, and hopefully we can address that last time. So uh, Tamar, Bob Lerman, Brent Parton from New America, thank you very much. And I'll turn it back over to you, Tamar, to uh, talk about the next panel. Thank you. So now I'm putting on my moderator's hat again, and let me ask the, um, uh, or putting on my moderator's hat, I haven't had it on yet, let me ask the um, second panel to come up. Yeah, how are we doing on time? Okay, we got plenty of time. Okay. I'm sorry? No, so wherever you want to sit. Well, why don't you sit in the middle? That was a good idea. A little red in the middle of the dark landscape. Um, let me find where we are. Okay. So, um, Oh, look at that. A lot of people emptied out. Don't leave. This is going to be the most interesting panel. These are the employers. Uh, <laughs> these are people who actually run programs and create standards. Um, so that's what this is. This is where now we're going to get a deep dive into, uh, you know, what this really looks like on the ground, who the employers are, who creates the standards. Um, I'm going to play kind of talk show host and I'm um, not introduce you at the top. You guys have biographies, but I'm going to sort of introduce you as I go, as I ask questions. So Laura Beeth, you are the Vice President for Talent Acquisition and Development at Fairview Health Services. And if we, as we've said a few times, that's the second uh, number two private sector employer in Minnesota. Tell us a little bit about the system and tell us about your Periop 101 program. Thank you, Tamar, and thank you for inviting me today. I'm really happy to share some of the work we have underway. So as Tamar said, I'm the Vice President of Talent Acquisition at Fairview, and in my scope, um, I have accountability for registered and unregistered apprenticeships. I oversee our academic arm, which is um, huge in a system like ours. We have 5,000 students a year um, that we work to pipeline, as well as um, looking at 150 education partners and 600 programs. I also started our Workforce Development Department in 1995, and we run our Work Learn programs through that department, as well as youth programs, partnerships with secondary, post-secondary, community-based organization, scholarship programs, and equity-based strategies and career pathways. Um, in addition um, to those, we have, um, I have the accountability for recruitment. And so we're recruiting almost 9,000 people a year, both providers and um, clinicians and non-clinicians, which require that we hire up, up to 160 people a week, and I'm bringing in 400 temps and staffing um, our contingent workforce as well as moonlight staffing for physicians. So you can see that when you have an organization like ours that spans across the whole state of Minnesota with 12 hospitals and 100 plus clinics and the largest mental health facility as well as many other services that we need both short, mid and long-term workforce recruitment strategies. Uh, we also need to be marketing those strategies to reach all individuals. So equity-based career pathways and apprenticeships are key for us. But tell us about Periop 101. Yes. Let's get to Periop so our Periop 101 program was one that we started in the late 90s. And it was, I think, the fourth or fifth um, non-registered apprenticeship program we ran. Um, and it was something that we had to find that critical um, nursing area that had such a high skill set in the operating room. And as you think of nursing programs, they do not spend a lot of time in the operating room. And that is such a critical area for patient safety when you're working with surgery, in surgery, working with surgeons. And so we started off by training one person at a time. And that was never going to meet our need. Um, over the last 
20 years, we've trained 255 nurses in the operating room. And that is a program that we partnered with, with a national organization called ORIN, to have the um, credentialed pr program that we could run as a cohort. We run that program multiple times a year. We have seen high quality. They test out at the end of that program. We have seen high retention. Um, with that program, we're always in the 98% of people graduating and staying with us, and it fills 80% of our jobs in that area. It is, um, you know, the ROI on that is incredible, um, as well as keeping high standards with patient safety and quality and making sure we have a constant pipeline. And so this is a good example of a non-registered um, program, but we also really take part in registered, too, with our state departments. Um, Minnesota Department of Labor, where we have 245 registered apprenticeships in medical assisting, surge tech, and nursing. So these are key, key strategies for us. And I do want to just address one quick thing. As you talked about high schools, I want to just answer the question about how do we market? What we did in Minnesota is one of our partners in one of our school districts who has a huge diverse population, some of the highest ACTs and some of the lowest in the country, we created a video to reach every single parent about apprenticeship and what we're doing and talking about the pathway for traditional college and the outcomes of how many people are actually graduating in six years and how much debt they have. And to show them the variety and that reached every student and every parent and every teacher. It's one way to have a strong message out there and it came from the superintendent. So, so, so Laura, I want to dig a little deeper on Periop 101. Yeah. Um, so we're going to talk later about registered and unregistered yeah. and why you pick each and why mm -hmm. you do some one way and the other. Yep. That's a good Absolutely. topic too. But what really fascinated me about Periop 101 was that you had the curriculum that you got from the organization mm -hmm. for the that was classroom yep. and, and online part. But then when you sent them off into the operating room, there wasn't a lot of structure around it. Um, you know, they're, they're in the operating room with real patients mm -hmm. opened on the table. And that in itself, you know, has to be harrowing enough. But more than that, it seemed like it was even without the structure that the preceptors were pretty successful at, um, you know, doing what they needed to do to make sure that the the students, the trainees were getting the on-the-job learning Correct. that they wanted. So, to, and, I, and I think that's a challenge in a lot of companies. Yep. You know, they, they send them out into the company and they follow somebody, but it doesn't amount to much. So how does that work out in your program? How do you yep. do it so well? You do it kind of by magic, it seemed to me. So, and how does it work? The healthcare industry in the sector is based on experiential learning. That's how it grew up. You know, everyone was an apprentice at one time, no matter what position you were in. And when I talk about taking in 5,000 students a year, hiring almost 9,000, we're in a constant training mode and we're an academic medical center. And so when we look at that training for Periop 101, first of all, the individuals um, that are applying for that program are already registered nurses. They know about safety, quality, um, customer service, teamwork, critical thinking. And so they are learning modules. Um, they're going through modules over a 26-week period, a module a week. And they're learning that piece. It could be draping. It could be um, uh, surgical interventions. It could be something with teaming. It could be wound care. And then they're applying that. But they're also working in a hospital setting in an emergency or in an operating room that is with other critical um, team members that are already either registered in that area, are a physician, are an anesthesiologist, are a nurse that's already went through the program and successfully in his teaching. So they are with a team of professionals that are helping them succeed. They are observing and then when they're ready, they take part in helping. But this is a long process. It's 26 weeks, plus even when they graduate, it's a couple years that they're continuing to learn. But they are already um, somewhat qualified with their license to hold those high standards, but then they take it really serious of what they can do when they're there. And our preceptors, also take that role quite serious. It's, it's a badge, it's an honor to be a preceptor, and so we want to make sure every experience has high quality. But so I think the answer, I mean, it's a lot of it's many strands, but I think what, what I'm taking away from that is that the they learn from the team and that the trainees have some agency in figuring out I'm going to practice what I learned yep. Yep. In, the, in, the, in the module when I get into that operating room. So they know the curriculum and what happens each week. To, to expose them to. So that's part of it is sharing and having transparency.
Okay, Robbie, I'm going to turn to you. Okay. So you're the president of your local fame chapter. That's I'm great. a big I'm a big fame fan. Uh, that's a new club. We're the Fame Fan Club. It's the growing. Federa- the Federation <laughs> for Advanced uh, Manufacturing Education. So tell us about fame. What is it? How it works? How the program works? All right, so a lot of the fun facts have already kind of been shared uh, earlier and and are included well in the paper, but uh, to highlight Fame is employer-led. Really, there's very little interaction from any government agency. Uh, And and many times today, the term uh, work and learn has come up. I like to add a third one. It's work and learn and earn. There's actually three stakeholders. There is the community college, uh, so that's the learn part of it. The earn part of it is the student and the employers, most importantly in this uh, this agreement, are, are getting the work. Uh, the students, uh, once they're selected, they kind of go straight to adding value to the companies. So it, it's pretty simple. A lot of this, uh, a lot of our recruits are straight out of high school. It's a pretty cool idea that they are applying to fame uh, kind of on the same uh, timeline that they would be to a four-year college. And uh, most of our students, when they come across the stage at their high school graduation, uh, they shake the hand of their principal and get a high school diploma, and then they also get a job offer from a local manufacturer. So uh, and just that idea alone kind of gives me goosebumps uh, because we're really changing the lives for a lot of the students, and this is what employers need. As you mentioned, it was generated. Uh, the idea kind of birthed about a decade ago at Toyota in Georgetown, Kentucky. Uh, manufacturers from the region uh, in Kentucky started to get involved, and uh, before we knew it, there were about a dozen chapters in Kentucky, and now we are uh, in about 11 states, uh, and that is growing rapidly. Uh, we constantly get inquiries from other states and uh, local communities on how do I get involved, and what do we do? We heard all this good stuff, so we like to uh, allow them to R&D, rip off and deploy uh, the, the program, and bring it back to their communities. So, so that's where we are now. We are in kind of an explosive growth. The, the, employ- the manufacturing employers are desperately in need of industrial maintenance technicians. Uh, the technology and in industrial uh, manufacturing has changed rapidly, a lot quicker than the education standards uh, and the amount of people going into these programs. So robotics and uh, vision-guided systems, all this uh, are now being trained kind of on cutting-edge technology. So t- talk, you know, employer-led you know, we think we all get that concept at, at the 60,000-foot yep. level. Um, if then you really see it at the ground level. Yep. So talk about, tell us about the um, the community college relationships in particular, because, I mean, that's where I think you really see it. Yeah, you know? so, so it's pretty neat. We do have a, uh, a, a board in our local community made up of, uh, in, in Greater Louisville, where I'm from, uh, roughly 20 to 25 employers. Not all of them sponsor an apprentice or an AMT student every semester, but they do stay involved. And there, there's this uh, bond or relationship between the student and the employer and the student and the community college. We have a really important position called a success coach, and they are kind of the liaison and that personal touch from the student uh, to communicate with the employer and, uh, and with the community college. So the, really the employers are advising the community college. When we meet, the instructors are there. And if the employers say we need more emphasis in uh, robotics or more emphasis in hydraulics or mechanical, uh, they're actually taking notes from the employers and it's real time. So we're able to move pretty quick. Uh, it's, it's fun being, you know, the partnership together, but, but the work is actually done on a volunteer basis by the employers, uh, kind of in the, in the driver's seat and the community college in the passenger seat. Yeah. I mean, from the observing it, I would not, you know, partnership is a nice word to kind of, you know, 20, whatever yeah. word. It's, you guys are the bosses. Right. And, pretty <laughs> much. Pretty pick, much. You pick the recruits for one yep. thing. You recruit the students yep. and you pick them. You say who gets in, who doesn't, not the college. And you do an RFP sometimes yep. for the college. Like, it's not like you, you decide. So, I mean, we're, we are businesses. We're good at running a for-profit business. So when uh, the Greater Global Chapter decided to kind of incept themselves, we did. We wrote an RFP, and we gave it out to local community colleges. We said, which one of you is going to offer us the best proposal to train the students that we need? And, and really, the, the secret sauce of fame and what employers need, and it, this is one of those things that goes across industries, across occupations, are the... Uh, what we call professional competencies, and and it's been brought up many times today. It's the initiative, the diligence, the communication, attendance, 
uh, personal relationships. Those are really uh, take take a front and center approach in in our AMT graduates uh, and where what they're going into the workforce with. Great. So, Mike, um, your turn. You're the president of one of these leading credentialing bodies, or well, now you're really the president of the educational arm of one of these leading credentialing bodies, um, the Automotive Service Excellence Educational Foundation. But for a long time, you actually were the guy who was in charge of coming up with the standards, right? Um, so, you know, we've been talking all morning about the certifiers and the standards that come out of these industry associations, and I think there's some skepticism, if not in this room, out in the real world, like are they serious, are they real, are they as good as the ones, you know, that the government would come up with? Um, so tell us about how how that works, how you develop those, you know, what those, what, how those standards work, how you yeah, develop First them. of all, if you want to know the answers to the, people always want to know the answer, what's the answer to the questions on the test? <laughs> the A and C test? Yeah, yeah, I'll tell you. Yeah. A, B, C, and D. So anyway, <laughs> ASC was founded uh, almost 50 years ago now uh, by the automotive industry. It's driven by the industry, service industry. And we started out with four tests for auto mechanics, and today we have 50 different test titles for automotive technicians, collision repair, school bus, medium heavy truck, just about every segment of the automotive industry. And um, we have about 250,000 people certified today. Right now, as we sit here in this room, somewhere across the country, there's probably a um, few dozen people taking one of our tests. We test. Uh, computer-based tests, used to be paper, pencil, um, all across the country, 500 test centers. So, and it's ongoing, 365 days a year. So, tell, but tell us, you know, how do I, so I'm the, I'm the, I'm Tamar's, I'm t running Tamar's, you know, ABC, automotive, whatever, and um, I'm trying to think about how to train my people. What would give me confidence in your curriculum? How do I know you really, you know, how do you develop that curriculum? How do you develop? Well, you don't develop the curriculum. My bad. You develop the standards. But right. how do you, how do I know that your standards really reflect what's needed in the industry? And how do you guys do that work of making sure that your standards reflect what's really needed in the so, industry? So Take we're us inside that black box. Sure. So we're training standards. agnostic. We're curriculum agnostic. We don't care where you get your training, how you get your training, whether it's OJT, you went to a community college. Uh, we don't care whose curriculum is taught at that community college. What we're interested in is the standards. Can you do the job? So the first thing we do is develop um, the job description and all the individual tasks that go into. If you're going to do breaks, there's a whole series of tasks that you have to be able to perform and be competent in. And so we want then the training to reflect, oh, we're going to train people to do all these things that are on this list. And we really kind of don't care where you got that education or whatever. Um, we just want to know at the end of the day you know how to do it. And so then the way we measure that is with multiple choice tests, um, which has limitations, but overall it's fair, it's accessible, uh, and uh, it's, it creates, a, uh, for our industry, what becomes nationally recognized, easily portable, very stackable, all the, the fun buzzwords. But you don't just sit there in your office and make that list. You have a very Not complicated, well. expensive process to... That list. So, so tell us about that. Right. So we don't dream up what you know what goes into working on brakes because um, you you may be aware you've seen the commercials right where a pedestrian walks out in front of a car and the car stops itself without you stepping on the brake. That's going to be standard on your car someday. Anybody know when? Soon. 2021. <laughs> Every car is going to have that technology on it now. Is that the same, you know, technology that they had even 10 years ago? No, it's, it's a major step up. So the technology is always changing, which means the job is always changing. So every few years we have to get the industry folks back together in a panel. And so we have representatives from GM and Toyota, but also the aftermarket, Firestone, the people who are actually doing the job, the trainers who are training to do the job, people who know the technology. And we all sit around and we say, okay, so what's not part of the job anymore? So rebuilding carburetors. I'll give you a, a clue. It's not on our test anymore because <laughs> carburetors went away 20 years ago, 40 years ago. Um, meanwhile, understanding these new electronic systems more and more and more is on the test. So number one, that gets you have to have that panel to put it on a task list. Now, oh, so I have a task list. Poof, I have a test. Oh, no, 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 because you have to write questions. And then all the questions have to be vetted by all the industry experts. Oh, that works on a Toyota, but it doesn't work on a GM. Mm, 
that doesn't work for the majority of everybody, I've got to throw that question out. So the questions all have to be fair to the majority of everybody in the industry, and then they have to be actually tested on a, on a sample of technicians to verify, yeah, not just the experts thought it was a good question, but hundreds and thousands of technicians also agree the right answer is right and the three wrong answers are wrong. And then you set a, a, a passing standard. Well, who sets the passing standard? Not the guy in the ivory tower. The industry panel comes back together. They decide what is the passing standard. And the beauty of all this is we didn't have to ask the government's permission to do any of this. It's a 100% voluntary program. So you can either choose to do it and have high standards, or you can choose not to do it, and we're okay with that. What we find is that, um, and you say, well, why would anybody bother? Well, so a couple of things. One is uh, when we research it, we find that um, certified technicians have lower turnover, longer tenure, uh, higher customer satisfaction index numbers, um, better fixed rate first time percentages. Um, uh, actually, they, they, they're more productive. So employers look at this and they say, well, is that causational or is that just correlational? And I say, who cares? <laughs> if you can get those sorts of results, then maybe that's a standard that you should aspire to through training and assessment and encouraging the technician to become a professional and not just you know, a guy who fixes brakes okay. Okay, so I want to leave some room. We're, we're fast approaching the end, um, but I want to leave some room, a couple mi minute or two for a question or two. So let's do a lightning round. And what I want to hear is, where what I'm interested in knowing is why registered, why unregistered versus registered? And Laura, you'll vote, so how do you make the determination? You, you know, make the, some fame employers pick one, the other, how do you make the determination? But I'm also interested in how you, um, you know, if you, how do you think we're going to grow this? How do you think we should, con we're going to convince other employers to do it? So maybe let's start with you, Robbie, and you can answer the questions to the degree. Sure. Let's start with you and let's come down the row and then we'll have a question or two for yep. the audience. So our program, the hours are apprenticeable should the employer decide to do so. However, what does that mean, apprenticeable? You mean you uh, they, they would qualify as hours uh, with the Department of Labor uh, if they wanted to be registered. However, most of our employers really don't care because it doesn't add a lot of value to their operations uh, as far as maintaining their equipment and, and facilities. So. Uh, my employer, for one, uh, we see no reason to do the registered apprenticeship. Uh, we need the technicians now to start working on the machinery and the registered portion of it really probably just kind of slows us down. It was made mention many times that there's some additional red tape. So, uh, I don't, I don't see the value, uh, to the actual for-profit companies of your employees having a, uh, a journeyman certificate, uh, when, when we can actually get them a college degree. Uh, and uh, in advanced manufacturing technology that that holds the the bearing and then actually it makes it easier and we have some pathways opened up to go into those four-year manufacturing education programs afterwards should they choose so, so how do you convince another employer to do it how do we scale it it's actually pretty easy um, I have yet to sit down with an employer that says this is not for me because everybody has the needs for these qualified industrial maintenance people uh, it's really just getting the the word out there and we are kind of uh, in our infancy still only about four years in our area but it was made mention earlier Bob I think by you that the brothers and sisters and guidance counselors and teachers and uh, educators are starting to see cohorts that have graduated into into you know companies that are providing really good living wages and opportunities and careers uh, with no debt and uh, a, you know a bright future so as those success stories continue to kind of filter through the communities uh, we are it, it's getting easier and easier and people are starting to approach us how do we how do we get involved how do we do it so uh, the, the word of mouth and the success stories has really done it. Great, great. Laura, same question. You register, how do you decide yeah. some programs registered, others not? And um, how do you convince other people to do it? So first of all, um, we see value in both, registered and unregistered, and we've been running them for years. So our registered programs usually involve most po more po post-secondary education and a credential, longer term, and there's a critical need to meet. There's a shortage around the country. For instance, with medical assisting, surge tech, um, also baccalaureate level nursing. And so we're looking at equity-based strategies to mirror our patient population and we want to work with our community-based organizations and government to be able to help with the wraparound services and other 
parts that bring this all together to really help with success. Many times these individuals need additional funding, and we're bringing in people that would not have been in to our system. So people that would have been left out or underemployed or in our medical assisting and surge tech program. When I look at our Periop 101 and even our IT programs, we have 149 individuals in unregistered IT credential programs. And that market is changing quickly with IT. They can get employed with certain um, certificates and courses. And so our goal was to diversify that department as well as um, look at, you know, competency-based hiring. So there was a need to move quickly to meet the market. And then when we look at our Periop program, there was a specific skill we wanted to advance. And we knew that um, if we could concentrate on that with flexibility, we would have that workforce. They're already licensed. What we do once these programs are in place, we share them. I believe we're an all-in. I've been the state chair for our Healthcare Education Center of Excellence for 20 years, as well as the governor's Workforce Development Board Chair and Vice Chair nationally for National Governors Association. And I have spoken around the country on this and sharing our best practices because it is an all-in, equity-based. And once we've created that cookbook, when they are registered, people can take it off the shelf and use it. And in Minnesota, everything that we've um, worked on that's taken well over a year for these registered programs, they can take it off and use it. And that's what's happening in the Twin Cities. They're doing that. Um, our unregistered programs, we are sharing as well, telling stories with Creating IT Futures, CompTIA, and others. And with our Periop program, we have shared that and um, talked to our other partners because they have shortages too. And we don't want to steal employees from each other. We want to develop people into these programs. So it's been a win-win for us. Great. Um, Mike, want to add anything to this? I just want to say I don't think employers in our sector don't, they probably don't know the difference, much less care. They have a business problem. I need... I need yeah, entry-level technicians to get in here and do the job. How do I how do I develop that? Somebody come, please come help me. Give me a turnkey solution for that. Yeah, yeah, that's. I mean, you find that in the in the college world too. Do they have a college degree? Or do they just know how to do it? No, no employer cares. Uh, do we have one question in the audience? I think we have time for maybe one or two. Bob, you have one. <laughs> yes, please, Brent. Let's go, Brent, and then Bob. Great question. Oh, well, we didn't have a mic. Uh, bad. Okay. So uh, the question was a good question. Let's see if I can do it here. Well, let's give you the mic and let you do it. I hope I can remember it. Uh, yeah, so you guys have done an incredible job as an industry group auditing competencies and making sure that people are learning the skills that are needed to get the job done, which is what employers need. Um, but just to project, thinking about the, the proposed IRAP system, or at least as outlined, envisions you possibly playing another role, which is not just auditing competencies and skills, but auditing the the way programs are organized, and mean, are they apprenticeships? Are people being paid on the job? Are they being mentored? Is that something you all would, you know, see yourselves as wanting to do? Is it beyond your core capacity? Would you see other players in the landscape playing that role? Yeah, we actually have two sides of the house. We have certification for the individual technicians. We also have accreditation for high school and post-secondary training programs today. We don't have anything that's apprenticeship specific. I think that's a kind of a hole in our portfolio because, again, employers, they're not, give me, they don't care if it's inside the box, outside the box, doesn't have a box, whatever. <laughs> give me a solution. And so I think apprenticeships are a big piece of the solution because, specifically because this is a skill that you can't, you know, you can, you can get it up here, but you have to actually do it to get it out here. And until you can do it out here, you're not a productive uh, worker. So, um, yeah, I think it, to us it makes sense. Uh, we're prepared to do both roles. Bob? Yeah, my question has to do with the coverage of the off-job uh, learning and the extent to which you have, um, let's say, the state of Kentucky pay for that or uh, other organizations pay for that. 
uh, versus paying yourself for that. I mean, having the companies pay themselves for those courses. And do you think that um, to the extent it was would be routine that in a an American apprenticeship, whether it be a fame apprenticeship or something else, if it were routine that that particular cost would be uh, at least shared partly by the government, would that help? And, and to point out, it is indeed shared partly by the government now. The community colleges are subsidized. I think that would definitely help. Uh, we want to be careful to kind of protect the brand of what we've built. Uh, that's made, been made mention today before. Uh, but definitely more funding for the students uh, to their college tuition would help. Uh, our tagline has been your degree debt free because the wages that they're making while they are doing on the job training are enough to cover their tuition. However, they still have rent and utilities and gas and food and some have families. So any financial relief for these positions would be uh, welcomed um, because the, the employers are doing all they can and some employers are able to sponsor some of the tuition through tuition reimbursement programs, but it's not uh, really cut and dry. Yeah. But also, you know, in a community college, right, tuition is part of what sustains a community college, but at most community colleges, it's not more than a third. So somebody's paying for the other right. two thirds. Yep. And so there already is the government paying for the other two thirds. Whereas Periop 101, you're paying for the classroom instruction. For Periop 101, we pay all costs um, for the classroom as well as precepting and um, just their time on the job, they get full-time wages. Some of our registered apprenticeships now, we would be paying toward tuition reimbursement, but there is some government funding that we braid because the cost of higher education, when you're getting a four-year degree, and we're looking at a doctorate level apprenticeship next, is quite expensive. And so um, having that extra support has been very beneficial, especially when we're addressing some of the equity-based strategies with medical assisting and surge tech. I mean, in a way, what we're seeing right here is that in, already in a lot of independent apprenticeships, there's some government subsidy for the off. Now, maybe not enough, and maybe it's not explicit enough, but there is some. Another question out there somewhere? We've got a few more minutes. Somebody has, must have a question? Yes, Brent, go, for, go wait. Ned, let me get you a mic this time. I'll make you repeat. Uh, the I, I hear your point on the journey card and the value to employers, but I think what's so fascinating, what's credible about your program is degrees. Mm -hmm. So just talk a little bit about why the degree and, and why that has been important. Is it about attracting high quality candidates? Is it really about you see this as a pipeline? You don't want people to stop out? And that's right. a question for the whole panel. Why? Why is integrating this with degree pathways important? All right, so uh, a couple responses. One of our hurdles uh, to, to finding applicants has actually been selling it to parents uh, because a lot of our incoming students are you know, high school students and we've had this stigma for the last 30, 40 years that you have to get some type of college degree, so that helps. Uh, working with the community college to develop the curriculum for the off-the-job training inherently then you know it, it, it's going to provide a degree so why not and and actually we do have I, I made mention earlier we've got quite a few uh, tracks now to where after your two-year associates degree you can do kind of the the old two plus two model and go right into a bachelor's degree so without having that that baseline uh, advanced manufacturing tech degree industrial maintenance I, I don't think the employee is quite as marketable and attractive so it, it definitely helps uh, to, to have the accreditation. Anybody else want to speak to that? Laura? Well, in healthcare, we're highly regulated, lots of degrees, lots of credentials. And so in order for our apprentices to be able to sit for licensure or sit for the certifications, they need to have either that diploma or that degree. So we need to have, what I try to say to everyone is we're not taking anything away. We're adding more with our apprenticeship. We may be adding some support that wouldn't have been there to help the people succeed. But in your industry, it's, people don't care about a degree. They want to see the ASC certification, right? True. They, certifications are important, too, is the point I'm trying to make. Yeah, yeah. Your certi certification is, in many cases, uh, you know, substitutes for your professional credential in our industry. But I would, I would argue that parents still today, uh, you know, they want their kid to get a good career, and that's a four-year degree. And so... One of our challenges is, honestly, um, 
people cut, that used to come into our industry, well, they grew up on a farm working on the farm tractor. They grew up like I did. I worked in my dad's shop growing up, so I knew what the industry was all about. I found my passion. There's no corner gas stations to work in anymore. There, you know, unless it's Nintendo, there's no, how do they find that passion? And frankly, I would argue that really and truly, you know, debt free and all that, you know, that's the, okay, you know, sounds good. Maybe I ought to get a 401k. I don't know if I'm 15, 16 years old. Am I thinking that long term? Maybe not. What I really want is what am I passionate about? What do I really care about? And so that's one of our challenges is trying to reach down and show those opportunities. Hey, you don't have to go, you know, to a four-year school and, you know, dead-end degree, uh, you know, if you're passionate about this. And so exposing that to middle school and, and younger high school students is, I think, is, is a key part of the challenge for folks in the vocational side. And I, I want to ask you guys all one more lightning question, but, you know, when I think about it, like, if I was an employer, how do I know whether the guy can really do or the woman can really do what I need them to do? I'd rather have Mike's list of competencies that got upgraded last week that's really about the job than to know they sat in some community college for two years, <laughs> frankly, myself. So, you know, I'd like to, I think for the parents right now, you need the degrees and maybe for the kids, and I'm not against degrees, but I would like to see the world where quality industry credentials are at least as valued as degrees, because I think they tell you, you know, if they're good, a lot more about whether the person can do the job. So let's have one lightning round. Let's see. I guess it's like, what do you? So, so we, you know, we talked all about policy for for a long time before you guys came up. Um, if you had to give one recommendation, a lightning round recommendation for what should be included in policy, and maybe it's just more money, or you know, and or maybe it has something to do with the quali questions about quality we were asking. What would your what would your one recommendation be? Well, I don't know if I have the recommendation for policy, but my recommendation for building a policy would be to engage more of the employers. Once again, in a room like this, uh, there, there's not even a whole lot of people that come from the industry. And uh, on, like the Kentucky Manufacturing Career Center board that I'm a part of, it's all recruiters and it's, uh, it's educators, and there's not enough people actually from the industry speaking from what they see 24 hours a day, seven days a week, how that they're keeping the job. So whatever we can do to, to, and it's hard because you have a day job and you're getting phone calls and you're working, but you have to motivate the industry folks uh, to really get involved. Great, great answer. Laura. I would second that, that please include industry in on that conversation. Also, as we work with partners, be open to those partners. Some are state school partners and some are private schools because we need to be nimble and we need to meet that need. And so, you know, many times they'll say only a certain school. And for us, we found that we have to be open in order to meet our geography and also just cost sometimes and then who's willing to get in that race. Interesting, interesting suggestion, Mike. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, the employers have to be bought in. Uh, they have to really be the foundation. And what we find is if we give them a solution that solves their business problem, it automatically benefits them, solves their business problem. It benefits all their employers or their employees because uh, they're making higher wages and more productive. And it benefits the customer who gets the car fixed right the first time. We think it's a win-win-win solution, but, you know, you, it, it's, it's all about the ROI for the employer. Get the industry involved. Great. So really interesting discussion. Thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you to our, uh, our first panel, and thank you to all of you for coming out in the snow. Great morning. Thanks. Thank you. Good job. If I can have an off-the-record comment to the people in here, um, <laughs> one of the biggest